Japanese horror has a distinct identity that sets it apart. Where Western horror films tend to lean heavily on immediate action, shocking imagery and surprise moments meant to startle the audience, Japanese films generally rely more on psychological horror, a slow burn that eventually consumes the viewer, inspiring an all-encompassing, long-lingering sense of dread. Unlike in Western horror, and especially in modern films of the last decades, J-horror films usually don't try to jump-scare the audience. Instead, the horror often originates from something that subconsciously resonates with the viewer. Ideas, images, feelings that stick with you long after watching it. One of the most prominent themes you can find employed in J-horror is the intersection of fear and technology. More than a few Japanese horror films have explored how technology, despite bringing about our hyper-connected society, can also bring out the worst in us. As we all know too well these days, technology can isolate us, toy with our sense of reality, and inspire sinister obsessions. It can drive us to commit acts of violence against others, or even ourselves. This is the story of one of the greatest Japanese horror films ever made. Satoshi Kon's 1997 animated feature, Perfect Blue. Perfect Blue is a dazzling piece of animation that explores issues of fame, identity, female agency, and mental illness. It's also a story about people and culture. How exactly did we arrive at this moment where technology has come to dominate our lives? And why does this new connectivity seem to be, paradoxically, making us more isolated and unwell than ever? Perfect Blue was created by the legendary director Satoshi Kon, who is responsible for some of the most highly acclaimed anime ever made. If you're familiar with his style, you just intuitively know when you're watching a Satoshi Kon movie. He brings a kind of razor sharpness to every aspect of his filmmaking. Writing, directing, art, character design, and most of all, his editing. Khan was such a masterful and accomplished director, you could easily spend an entire video, say, just discussing his technique. If you haven't seen it already, Every Frame of Painting did this wonderful video on the filmmaking of Satoshi Khan. It's well worth your time, and it's a great appetizer for what I'm going to explore in this video. But in order to decipher the message and meaning of Perfect Blue, we need to take a trip way, way, way back in time to the faraway and distant era of the 1990s. Shirin Laga Beer! Disney. By the dawn of the 1990s, Japan was in a position of unparalleled economic strength. Less than 50 years after the country had been devastated by World War II, Japan had re-emerged from the ashes as an economic powerhouse. One that seemed destined for global domination. Beginning in the 1970s, the country experienced an economic bubble driven by the hyperinflation of real estate and stock market assets. 
the value of Japanese assets kept going up, 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 and a combination of cheap credit and loose monetary policy by the Japanese government meant that every market in the world was flooded with yen. This period in Japan was known as the Baburu Keki, the bubble condition or bubble economy. And during this time, one of the main drivers of the so called Japanese miracle was the country's advancements in consumer electronics and computer technology. Computer systems like the PC 9800 brought home computing and with it early forms of the internet to the Japanese public, many years ahead of the West. So by the time the Western internet was in its infancy, Japan had already seen the rise of its robust culture of bulletin boards, anonymous message boards and chat services. With a bubble economy in bloom, a networked and high-tech Japan had risen to become a global economic superpower. Many of our most enduring tropes of a hyper-advanced and Japanese-dominated future are rooted in the pop culture of this era. But the influence and importance of this period of history stretches far beyond just consumer electronics. The world began to truly believe that Japan was at the forefront of a bold new historical era, where man, machine and network would become one. Come on, let me in. Access granted. Writers and futurists offered us tales of a Japanese-dominated future, a vision that became to be beloved by the world and still endures to this day. Many of our most popular depictions of transhumanism, the merging of humans and machines, came directly out of Japanese technological progress and the pop culture it inspired. Japan was the first country to successfully make bipedal robots. They're still the best in the field of robotics. And Japanese cartoons played some part in that? They did. Japan was truly riding high in these heady times. The world believed that the Japanese miracle was the key to the future of human progress. We all needed to start acting more like the Japanese, or so the experts said. The wizards of capitalism believed that the good times would never end, it would only keep getting better. The American economist Francis Fukuyama even wrote a book called The End of History and the Last Man, and he cited Japan in support of his thesis. He theorized that at long last we had reached the end of history and that humanity's future lay in the kind of ultra-deregulated market exemplified by Japan. But what happened next? Nobody saw coming. In the blink of an eye, everything changed. Japan's economy began to overheat and inflation ran out of control. Investors panicked and rapidly pulled their money out of the country. By 1993, the Japanese asset bubble had almost entirely evaporated, wiping out the equivalent of trillions of dollars in wealth. Indeed, to this very day, Japan's Nikkei stock market has never reached the heights it attained in 1990. It was the start of what is known as the lost decade, what Japan calls the 1990s. And as the bubble economy burst, the dreams of a revived and dominant Japan went with it, leaving behind a ghost that still haunts pop culture today. In the wake of this collapse, and as the country entered the second half of what would become a decade-long depression, strange new currents began to emerge in Japanese society. As the country slid further into the last decade of the 1990s, Japan saw a niche social phenomenon burst into the mainstream, the otaku. An otaku is a young person, and it was always a young person, who has an obsessive interest in pop culture and computers. And this passion often goes hand in hand with a complete lack of social skills. An otaku is a guy like me who likes Japanimation. Now to be clear, the term otaku has come to define a broad range of interests. It can refer to anime and comic fans, video game players, toy collectors, music aficionados, and even complete shut-ins, the so-called hikikomori, 
who shun all human contact in favor of living their entire life online. Otaku is, in the literal sense, the Japanese word for another person's house. Historians believe that it was first coined by the humorist and essayist Akio Nakamori, who used otaku as a synonym for unpleasantly obsessive fans of anime and manga. The term stuck, and it grew as a byword among Japanese subcultures and fandoms. But in 1989, the word otaku would take on an entirely new and darker meaning. Tsutomu Miyazaki, a mild-mannered photo technician in his mid-twenties, was one day discovered to be the perpetrator of sickening acts of rape, pedophilia, cannibalism, vampirism, and necrophilia against four random young girls. Miyazaki was also an obsessive collector of movies and anime. Among his collection of nearly 6,000 videotapes, Investigators found that he had interspersed pictures and footage of victims into some of his cassettes of anime and slasher films. Miyazaki had made himself the star of his own twisted fantasy world, and he had used pop culture and technology to do it. He was known in the Japanese press and subsequently in international media as the otaku murderer. And Miyazaki's story became the main inspiration behind the book, Perfect Blue, Complete Metamorphosis, written by Yoshikatsu Takeuchi, which was published in 1991 and followed by Satoshi Kon's movie adaptation six years later. Perfect Blue tells the story of the fictional pop star Mima Kirigue, the lead singer of the famous idol trio Cham. Even though Mima has achieved massive popularity as an idol singer, she resolves to quit Cham in order to become a serious actor, as she openly yearns to be free from the limitations that are imposed on her by her good girl persona. Now, an idol is like a supercharged and distinctly Japanese version of pop stardom. Beginning in the 1970s and 80s, female Japanese pop stars became high-profile celebrities in their own right. An idol could be a singer, a dancer, an actor, or some combination of all three. By the 90s, the idol phenomenon had diversified quite a bit, and Japanese screens and airwaves featured idols with a wide array of talents. The idols of the 90s, for example, tended to be quite a bit younger than their counterparts from the 70s and 80s, and they also placed a much greater emphasis on being outwardly cute and wholesome. <laughs> Solo acts, though, were on the decline in the 90s, and many idols instead chose to join together as multi-member groups, a practice you still see today across China, Korea, and Japan. <laughs> Many Japanese idols also became famous for their work as voice actors in anime and video games. Singing idols have given their vocals to some of the most beloved theme music in anime history. Idol and otaku two of the foundational phenomena of modern Japanese pop culture. They're also the first impressions on the viewer as Perfect Blue begins. Right away, the movie is setting the stage for the audience. At its outset, Perfect Blue is asking you to consider the duality of these images and whether they might be in any way connected. Mima leaves Cham to start her new life as a television actress and her resignation sparks an immediate uproar from the group's passionate male fanbase. The backlash quickly escalates. Mima receives an anonymous fax from an otaku named Mi Mania, who accuses her of being a traitor. Shortly after that, a maniacal Cham fan mails an explosive device to the set of Mima's new show, injuring one of the crew members. The past that Mima thought she had left behind has come back to haunt her present. 
But Mima remains undeterred. As she struggles to adjust to her new life as a serious actress, she lands a string of roles in shows about sex, crime and murder. In the hopes of jumpstarting her career by taking on a truly provocative role, Mima agrees to play a rape victim in an upcoming episode of a TV crime drama. There's very little nudity or actual violence shown in this simulated rape scene, and yet it feels so visceral and, despite being animated, almost real. It's one of the most graphic and disturbing things I've seen in film. At first, the gambit seems to work. Mima's career starts to take off. But we see that, despite her denials, she was completely unprepared for the trauma this rape performance would cause in her and the scars it would leave on her psyche. And it is in this exact moment, where her present is most in doubt, that she is confronted by a strange vision from her past. An ethereal apparition of her flawless, idle self in pastel pink and white. An illusory embodiment of her previous life that mocks her by nonchalantly skipping and gliding across the nighttime streets of Tokyo in her despair. Her roles as an actor begin to bleed into the real world, and she becomes increasingly unable to distinguish fantasy from reality. As she continues to grapple with her traumatic experiences, her reality begins to twist, morph and disintegrate. And at the same time, the dream Mima takes on a life of her own. This illusion of herself haunts her like a waking dream. She starts to believe that she really was stalked, attacked and sexually violated. That she is the character she once portrayed. The movie accelerates to a breakneck pace as it reaches its climax. Mima begins to experience events jumbled, fragmented and out of order. Shocking and dramatic revelations are turned on their head and revealed to be just dialogue for another one of her TV roles. Mima is turned into a textbook unreliable narrator and the viewer can no longer be certain whether what they're seeing is real or just a TV program. It's a remarkable breaking of the fourth wall that also aligns the themes and plot of the movie with the audience's emotional journey. And it's just one example why Perfect Blue is such a masterwork of horror cinema. As she continues to spiral downward, Mima submits to further sexual degradation in pursuit of her career. The dream Mima becomes even more assertive, haunting Mima's every waking moment. And worse still, a stalker killer is closing in on her, leaving a string of grisly murders in his wake. Until finally the tension becomes too great to bear. These dueling delusions, these twin madnesses collapse in on each other and shatter completely. Perfect Blue is the dark and sinister side to Japan's perpetually cheery idol culture. It is a fable about the human cost of hypercapitalism and the pursuit of perfection where people become commodities for public consumption. Like the bubble economy that birthed it, the idol celebrity is ultimately a hollow being. When faced with the slightest bit of pressure, it will suddenly pop. This last part is a great segue to discuss one of the film's most critical themes, female agency and identity in an oppressive world. Perfect Blue's plot, tone and themes make it almost disingenuous not to look at this film through the lens of feminist theory. 
Over the course of the story, our protagonist Mima is largely portrayed as passive and lacking in agency and autonomy. And by that I mean that Mima, as she's shown in the movie, appears to have very little direct control over the course of her life. When it comes to her career, Mima is totally and completely differential to whatever her managers tell her to do. And as she makes the choice to set her personal life aside in order to advance her career, she puts herself at the mercy of these seemingly omnipotent forces. The questions about female agency raised by Perfect Blue are a brutal verdict on the state of Japan's idol industry. But even more critically, this angle of analysis is crucial to fully illuminate one of the film's central themes. By the 1990s, the expectations around the behavior for Japanese idols had changed. They were now expected to be stereotypically feminine and cute in both appearance and presentation. Idols were highly infantilized in Japanese media, with the most popular idols celebrated for their childlike and vulnerable behavior. 12, 12, 12. If you're a devoted fan of anime, then this probably sounds a little familiar. These stereotypes around idol behavior also informed what we know as the saccharine sweet moe trope. But in Perfect Blue, this mixture of femininity and infantilization is a stinging indictment of the dark side of Japanese kawaii culture. An idol is, in essence, totally and completely defined by the role she plays. The demands of the idol's career dictate how she spends her free time, who she can be friends with, who she can date, and even what she can eat. In that sense, it's only natural that Mima desired to break free from her career as a singer and begin a new chapter in her life. But while the story of Perfect Blue may be distinctly Japanese in tone and character, it's every bit as relevant to how the world views female pop stars today. Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, Rihanna, Miley Cyrus, Selena Gomez, Ariana Grande, all of these celebrities began their careers by first establishing a squeaky clean public image as a pop star. And just like Mima, all of them suffered trials and tribulations that led to a bad girl phase, where their persona became more explicit, more provocative, and more sexualized. And after that, these stars all underwent highly publicized rebirths, where they re-emerged as fully formed adult celebrities. In many ways, the story of the modern celebrity is the story of Perfect Blue. An endless cycle of self-discovery, trauma, and rebirth. And all of it performed for the benefit of an omnipresent consumer audience. Now the movie is direct about this theme. It isn't trying to obfuscate the message or hide things from the viewer. So, the message is clear. In order to become more adult and achieve true career success, aspiring celebrities must first submit to an external gaze of society, a society whose viewpoint and voracious sexual appetite is explicitly understood to be male. But this way of thinking is a trap. Surrendering your own agency and self-determination can never lead to empowerment. So as Mima surrenders more and more of herself to her career, she becomes increasingly engrossed by what the outside world thinks about her and expects from the idea of the person she represents. As it is, for example, embodied by the message board posts of vitriolic fans. And as she, the actual person behind the idol, struggles to please everyone and meet the expectations of those fans, her own sanity continues to disintegrate. As a young woman, Mima is in the period of turmoil and constant change, both in her career and her personal life. But rather than living as a complete, autonomous person, one able to make her own choices with her own agency, she's perpetually boxed in by what someone else thinks of her or wants her to do, or things she should say to confirm the idea she embodies. Mima is caught in the paradox of that age-old trope. 
the Madonna-Whore duality. As a woman, she's expected to maintain an impossible balance of behavior, virginal and pure in one moment, but then at the drop of a hat, totally objectified and sexualized. It's a bizarre contradiction that women still must grapple with today. The expectation that they must be all things to all people at the same time. Always pleasing, never contradicting, never arguing, never asserting oneself. Always defining yourself on someone else's terms. A commodity to serve solely for the gratification of others. A culturally predetermined path to complete alienation and madness. We're getting close to the final, and perhaps most critical, theme of Perfect Blue. But first, we need to go back to the beginning. Remember that brilliant opening scene we talked about earlier? One of the most interesting visual cues here are the fans at the Cham concert. A faceless, undifferentiated mass of humanity staring back blankly at those on stage. It's the relationship between creator and audience in the modern age captured and crystallized in a single moment. Under the stage lights, a performer who is expected to literally bear it all and put their most intimate self on display for the viewer to consume. And on the opposite side of the fourth stage lurks the unknowable and inscrutable monster known as the audience. This moment is both expert foreshadowing and an expression of Perfect Blue's most relevant and frightening theme. The relationship between audience and creator, and how a hyper-technological fandom has permanently blurred the lines between the two. <laughs> As with the movie's other major themes, this point is delivered explicitly to the audience through dialogue spoken by the characters. Once again, there is no obfuscation or trickery here. The movie is telling you bluntly what it's all about. <laughs> To drive this point home, the film makes extensive use of reflections. Images of mirrors, the windows of buildings and cars, and the screens of TVs and computers. Reflections in perfect blue represent the unconscious mind, the self that is hidden from everyday society, lurking just below the surface. But in the right moment, and when viewed at just the right angle, these illusions leap out of their confines and take on a life of their own. Throughout Perfect Blue, the audience comes to understand that reflections are a doorway to a realm of illusion, a symbol of how easily our sense of self can be twisted and shattered. But we also see that these illusions are no more or less real when they're transmitted to us by a TV or computer screen rather than reflected in a funhouse mirror. When another person is simulated for us right in front of our eyes and in extreme detail, our psyches invariably fall prey to the illusion that what we're seeing is real. And we start to act as though we're forming a real reciprocal relationship with the object of our affection. But these images are illusions, and they are not real. They are one-sided obsessions, and the object of our desire has no real way of interacting with us, or returning the sentiment. In the psychological literature of the 1950s, as researchers were observing the effects of the mass adoption of radio and television across society, this phenomenon came to be known as parasocial interaction. Americans at the time came to believe that mass media personalities in TV and radio were their close personal friends despite never having interacted with them. Sounds familiar? 
Whoa! Wow! Thank you so much. Uh, I no scope JFK. Wow! Twenty five dollars, man. That's so generous. I love you for this. As a matter of fact, you have earned the buddy thumb. We're officially buddies now. But Perfect Blue describes something different, something darker. A shared delusion that is only made possible by the emergence of new and highly advanced consumer technology like personal computers and the internet. This might sound like something out of science fiction, but it's actually been a well-known psychological condition for nearly two centuries. The French behaviorists who discovered this condition called it folie à deux madness of two, where a person suffering from a delusion or a psychiatric syndrome spreads their condition to another person, almost like an infectious disease. Modern psychology describes this phenomenon as shared psychosis, or in the most extreme cases, mass hallucination. Just as Mima's otaku fans are obsessed with every single career move she makes, she too becomes obsessed with how she is perceived by her fandom. Their obsession of her becomes her own. But this notion of shared psychosis takes on an even darker twist in the movie's finale, where we learn that the true antagonist all along was Mima's manager, Rumi, the most caring, protective, and motherly figure in the entire film, was hiding her own sinister secret. When she was younger, Rumi herself failed in her career as an idol. Now, she's living vicariously through Mima in the hopes of getting another shot at her dream. While her name, Rumi, is a quite common feminine given name in Japan, if you mirror it, it becomes the mirror. Mi, Ru, Mirror. Rumi, R, U, Mi. Rumi lived out the phantasm of her unfulfilled past by masquerading as the real Mima, and she constructed an elaborate, fictional online persona to complete that fantasy. She tried to turn this delusion into reality by killing everyone who she believed was responsible for Mima's descent to depravity, her manager, the writer of the TV show, and even the actors involved in the episode. Rumi became possessed by her old life as an idol, and was able to infect Mima with her delusion thanks to the interlocking technologies of consumer electronics, mass media, and the internet. And as we see from the fallout of Mi Mania's online message board posts, Rumi may have shared her psychosis with far more people than just Mima. Rumi and Mima, the past and present of the Japanese idol industry trapped within a delusion and haunted by images from their past. But in the closing moments of the movie, in that brilliant climactic instant in which Mima dances in front of the headlights of an oncoming truck, we come to understand that she was never in any real danger. This Mima was really Rumi, deep in the grips of psychosis. It was only by saving Rumi, both symbolically and literally, that Mima is finally able to break free from this madness. She must save herself from herself. Perfect Blue suggests to the audience that obsessive fandom is a grotesque perversion of humanity. It is a distorted and hyper-consumerist reflection of the real human emotions of love, kindness, and devotion. It can never be anything more than simulacra, a distant shadow on the wall of Plato's cave. The only way forward is to find the strength to shatter this black mirror completely. Otaku were an extreme social outlier when Perfect Blue first came out in 1997. But things have changed quite a bit in the 20 years since then, haven't they? Because something has finally come to pass that none of us could have predicted. Not Satoshi Kon, not Francis Fukuyama, not even Billy Gibson himself saw this one coming. 
Thanks to the power and pervasiveness of the internet, otaku-style fandom has completely consumed the globe. These days, pretty much everyone under 40 who grew up in the industrialized world is some form of otaku, depending on their preferences. They might be a traditional otaku, obsessed with anime and video games, or they might be a more mainstream variety of otaku with, for instance, encyclopedic knowledge of sports statistics, pop music, superhero movies, you take a pick. In our modern-day hyper-consumerist health space, ultimately we are all otaku. We are all participating in online fan communities, constantly plugged in, networking among fellow obsessives on social media, on message boards, in comment sections, news aggregators, at home on our computers or on our phones and tablets while we're on the move. No matter what you're into, there is an online subculture out there just waiting to pull you in and consume you. Your consumer identity does not just happen at random anymore. It's being cultivated for you as a digital tribe of marketing space to occupy, inhabit and carry as your banner into the battlefield of the open market. Fandom is no longer the exception. It's become an exploitable commodity for mega corporations. As fans, we are evangelists. And we are, all of us, now living in the state of perpetual hyperreality. Once you've seen Perfect Blue, you may find that the strange horror depicted in this film has, in the two decades since it came out, become uncannily familiar and all too real. Every day of our lives, is perfectly blue. We are all Tataku now. But she was not saying no. However we may interpret his remarks, one thing is clear. He understood, at least in part, the difference between his make-believe and ours. Uh, for example, Baron, uh, some deep-seated suspicion made him see in you an enemy. And in his habit of mind, that enemy was given a name from his world of fantasy. H TTP no Ananka Deta Sore Deto Nani Nani Atata Hello and welcome to my internet homepage. Um this is Ragnar and this is a special thank you to my biggest fans. <laughs> My biggest fans are Hunter Crawford and Margaret Strong, Adriel, Heraclit, Mr. Burgadon, Sean Quigley, Zach Plord, Vladimir Baciu, Mima Kirigue, Arcel Markerson, Jin Hansen, Dennis Pfefferkorn, Kaspar Ram, Pascal Fehling, Dace Phoenix, Vincent Kavanaugh, Levi Mollett, Roman Wasenmüller, Max Herbert, Matt Davis, Cameron Richter, Mido Reno, Jacob Woodward, Michael Grillo, Noelani Telemoni, Mura Casardes, Stephen Bischoff, Carlos Bellari, Dimitar Slavko, Lucas, Adam Burr, Domko, Martin Schmidt, Agustin Ortega, Adam Cross, Danny Sandel, Trent Hallett, Milfed, Joe Kerr, Zero Anonymity, Carl Jura, Evan Tickford, Nathan DeGrand, Brian F., Kevin H. Yang, Nicolas Rosa Puch, Swagum, David Zalanak, Gehenas, Malum, Quentin Podom, Cholek, Chuck Taylor, Dominic Hitai Bako, Liam Jones, Micha Nestler, David Nadeau, Ryan, Haley, 
Lord Inquisitor, and Chris. Until next time, sayonara. Sayonara.